I'm very excited to be doing this webinar together with my dear friend Butch and my dear colleague and friend and family member Ursula Edwards in, in uh, Victoria Falls. Butch is currently in Bulawayo, I think. He's escaped the bush just for us because he needs a proper a connection, internet connection for, for, for this webinar. I'm super excited. We actually planned this webinar quite a few weeks back. I would say even a couple of months back, wasn't it, Butch, when we chatted, you know, one, one of our Skype chats. And we set the date and then suddenly Zimbabwe decided to open borders and then suddenly the first international flight arrived and we are perfect in terms of our timing, which makes me super happy. And I'm sure the audience is equally happy because these are um, new beginnings. Um, it's an emotional time for all of us. Um, it's been a very, very difficult almost seven months. We're still here. Hey, we are all still here and we will still be here next year and in two years. We'll get through this. And um, our Wangi webinar this afternoon is supposed to just be a bit of a, a tiny light at the end of the tunnel um, to inspire you guys to sell Zimbabwe even more than what you've done before, to maybe to motivate your clients to travel. I know that there is a lot of travel warnings out there, but I also know that Zimbabwe is one of the few countries without restrictions um, as a destination. So in terms of the country being open, it's open to all destinations. Of course, the rules and regulations in each source market is different, but what's important is that if your clients wish to travel, they can, they just need a negative PCR test that's not older than 48 hours um, when they arrive. Um, just quickly, a quick briefing about how we're going to do this. So I'm going to hand over in a minute to Butch. He's the managing director of Invelo Safari Lodges. Uh, they have stunning products in Wengi, also a couple in uh, Victoria Falls, but what's very important is that today we, our focus is entirely on Wengi. Uh, Butch has a lot of experience, he's been around forever. Butch, I don't want to say it because you look like 35, so I have no idea how you can have experience of 40 years plus. <laughs> um, Ursh also has more than 30 years of experience in the industry. She will uh, chat to you after Butch's presentation, so the idea is that Butch will start now doing his PowerPoint. He'll speak about the different areas, the experiences, all of that. And then once Urs takes over, she will focus a little bit more on the logistics, on the access. And if you have questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A or in the chat. I see that the chat is already going. So if you have questions, just type them into the chat um, field and we will read the questions while Butch speaks and then we'll answer them after Butch is finished with his presentation. We're actually recording this whole thing, which is exciting because I know quite a few of um, the international agents wanted to join this afternoon and couldn't make it. So we will make this recording available on Vimeo and on YouTube. We'll send out the recording on a mail shot in the next few days. And I hope I didn't forget anything. So I would like to hand over now to Butch. Butch, you need to sw switch on your microphone and wish everybody a beautiful journey to Wangi. Chat later. Hi, good afternoon to you all. It's afternoon here anyway. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, okay, I'm going to, as Karina said, I've been in uh, Wangi a long time. I first came to Wangi as a, a cadet ranger with the Department of National Parks in uh, 40 years ago. So I've been working in and around Wangi for uh, ever since. Um, so I'm very, very fond of Wangi. It's one of my most favorite places in the whole world, obviously. And um, I'm going to explain to you today and talk to you a little bit about why I firmly believe that Wangi is the best national park in Africa. Uh, and a lot of very good reasons why that's the case. And I think you'll agree with me by the end of it. Um, hang on, I've got a technical hitch here. I'm just trying to, there we go. Okay, the big question is uh, why Wangi? And I believe there's two very good uh, overarching reasons why Wangi is a great park to visit. The first one is that there's very few visitors there. Um, you can do the numbers, but the number of visitors that visit Wangi every year, uh, if you work it out in terms of number of visitors per square kilometer per annum, we have about five visitors per square kilometer per annum. 
Serengeti is five times higher, and Kruger is 16 times higher than that. So it gives you an idea. Wangi's got uh, these small numbers of tourists there, so you've got, um, you've got big areas to yourself. Another way to measure it is, um, I believe, inside Wangi itself, there's about 15 um, lodges and um, uh, camps, and uh, that equates to about one camp or one lodge per 1,000 square kilometers. That's one camp or one lodge per 100,000 hectares. So very, very low densities of visitors, okay? The other reason I believe a national park is important for, from a, a visitor standpoint is there must be lots of animals. And Wangi clearly has that. We've got 50,000 elephants. We've got the highest elephant density in our dry seasons that you can find anywhere in Africa. And that means on the planet. Um, we've got the highest uh, both mammal and bird species list of any national park in uh, Zimbabwe. There's lots to see. We've got um, lots of lions, lots of wild dog, all kinds of interesting animals that people like to see, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. Okay, the next thing here is a map, you know, and this tells you about where Wangi is. Now, Wangi lies at the very heart of what we call a Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area, okay? We abbreviate that and call it Kaza TFCA. Now, the Kaza TFCA um, is perhaps the most exciting, the most visionary, the biggest thinking conservation project in Africa today. And it's heavily funded by uh, the German government and I guess the German taxpayers, thank you, Karina. Um, but what it equates to is there's um, 500,000 square kilometers. That's half a million square kilometers. It's a huge area. It spans five different countries and 14 different national parks, okay? So we're talking about a huge swathe of Africa that is becoming all part of this Transfrontier Conservation Area. But at the very heart of it, at the very heart of it lies uh, the core. And I believe the core is the Okavango Chobi in Botswana and Victoria Falls where Ursula lives and Wangi National Park, which I'm talking about to you today. And Wangi is the oldest park in this uh, TFCA. Uh, the Robbins Game Sanctuary was uh, started in 1914. So it's been around for over a hundred years. And that's what makes Wangi so important in this big conservation project. Okay, any story about Wangi has to start at Victoria Falls Airport. Um, and that's, that's fast becoming the hub for this, this part of Africa. Uh, you Pre-COVID and post-COVID, you're gonna be linked up with um, other parts of Africa and international flights coming in from um, overseas. Um, and if you're gonna be passing through Victoria Falls, <coughs> I think, excuse me, I think it's very important for you to visit Victoria Falls. It's a bucket list place. Um, everybody wants to see it. It's this, one of the natural wonders of the world. Uh, and I myself, I've been there hundreds of times, uh, maybe even thousands, I don't know. But every time I go there still, it's a great thrill to see it, whether it's high water, it's low water, or somewhere in between, it's beautiful in the morning or in the evening. Um, but to move on, once you've visited the falls, you want to come to Wangi National Park. And Wangi National Park's story as a game reserve starts um, with a railway line. And uh, this is part of the railway line that uh, Rhodes pushed through. He was in his in British imperial dream of running a railway line from Cairo, to, from Cape Town to Cairo. And it came through the area of what is Wangi today in 1904, okay? And the first warden of Wangi Game Reserve, as it was known then, was a man called Ted Davison. And his story is a wonderful story, I believe. Um, he was a 24-year-old man in 1928, and he jumped off the train at a, uh, at a siding called Kennedy, which is right in the middle of, uh, of uh, the central part of Wangi today. And uh, he started as a young colonial officer to uh, start the work that uh, eventually culminated in Wangi National Park. Um, and I believe uh, of the colonial era game rangers and game wardens, he's definitely one of the, the top five in Africa, but it's a, a, a wonderful story. And um, the National Park, as we have it today, is 14 and a half thousand square kilometers, okay? It's a huge tract of land. Um, but what's great about it is it's got great diversity. Up in the north, you've got hills and river lines. In the south, you've got sand country. And I'd encourage you after this um, uh, presentation to study this map. There's lots of interesting information on it, geology and vegetation. And you can really learn a lot from it. Uh, this map's also got all of the camps marked on it, so you can understand a little bit about the geography. But what you also see, 
excuse me, what you also see is how spread out the camps are. Uh, all those squares are 10 kilometers plus, um, and everybody's well spread out, and there's lots of room, and lots of places where there's no camps. And I spend a lot of time trying to explain to people about Wangi's vastness, you know? It's easy to give these numbers, but this is a picture taken from a drone uh, looking west across Wangi. And if you could take the same picture at night or take the same view at night, you would um, see absolutely uh, no firelights, no lights of any camps at all. Um, it's completely um, uh, wild and it's true, true wilderness in the, um, in the very, very best sense of, sense of the word. This is a photo taken up in the north of Wangi. Up in the north, we've got some topography. There's some small hills and you see down below, there's a sandy river uh, with a herd of buffalo in it. And it's completely different to what you've got down in the southeast, for example, where you've got these great big open plains, big open plains country. Um, a lot of people arrive there and they say it reminds them of East Africa, but it's not East Africa, this is in Wangi, you know? And um, of course in Wangi, there's about 20 different lodges, both in the national park and around the periphery, lodges or camps, and they're all very, very different. And that's what makes it great. Um, and that's what makes it possible for experts like you've got at Safari Destinations who can put together itineraries for you that go camp to camp. So you don't have to just visit Wangi and go to one camp. You can actually spend a week or 10 days in Wangi um, traveling between different camps. They're all different, they're all interesting, and they've all got lots of animals. And when you're moving around Wangi, when you're moving between camps, it essentially is just a game drive. And you're on a, a game drive vehicle with one of Wangi's famous guides, and, and whether it's a two, three, four, or even a five hour transfer, it's just a nice game drive, not a, a transfer. And you'll always have cool drinks or a picnic lunch on your um, Land Rover or Land Cruiser uh, to break up the journey. But what's also cool in Wangi is we've got eight different airstrips and each of those airstrips service a different portion or different part of the park. And it's a great way for you to either come into or out of Wangi or to move around within Wangi is using uh, charter aircraft. And again, um, Ursula and the Karina and the team at uh, Safari Destinations will give you a, a hand putting that kind of trip together. Personally, my favorite way of traveling across Wangi is on the Elephant Express. And this is a, a purpose-built rail car. It's a 20 seater and it does about an 80 kilometer trip across Wangi Park down that railway line I spoke of earlier, traveling from Det down to a place called Ngamo. Uh, and you, of course, along the way, you're game doing and elephants and lions and all kinds of cool animals. Okay, but let's talk about some of the things that we see in Wangi, okay? I spoke to you earlier about the elephants, okay? Elephants are uh, about 80 or even 90% of the biomass of the mammals in Wangi National Park. And Wangi's elephants are renowned both in Zimbabwe and throughout Africa for being well-natured, well-mannered, and even-tempered because historically they been, haven't been uh, traumatized. Uh, and the experiences that you can have with these elephants are awesome in the true sense of the word. Imagine uh, the experience of that uh, young guys having there next to that water hole there with a the camera just surrounded by elephants. Um, and this kind of thing is easy to do in Wangi, no other people anywhere. And of course, where else in Africa can you get a, a dinner show like that, but you can get it in Wangi. Uh, and that's what's special about Wangi's elephants. They're not interested in harassing people or harassing you. They come there, they come and drink their water while you have your dinner and they get on with their lives and you get on with uh, just having an incredible experience. But Wangi, of course, is not just about elephants. We've also got wonderful um, other wildlife. Our lions, we're famous for our lions. We've got one of the largest lion populations in the Kaza TFCA. We've got 600 adult lions uh, and gosh knows hundreds more young ones and cubs. And this particular lion is one of my favorites. Uh, he's actually Wangi's oldest lion now. He's 14 years old. His name is Vusi, and he's well known for being really well-natured and well-mannered. He poses for the photographers and he doesn't harass people, the guides when you're on a walking trail. And he lives up in the north of the park now. Another one of Wangi's famous lions is a lion called Mvu. And Mvu literally means hippo. And this lion is called a hippo because when he first came onto everybody's radar as a young, a, a young male lion, he was seen attacking and trying to kill a hippo all on his own. Um, 
but later on in his late, later years now, he spends a lot of his time in the western part of the park. And this is a photo that I got a few years ago of him lounging on the veranda of an abandoned ranger station in the far west of the park. And you can still see him there often today. I saw, actually saw him out there last week. And some wonderful prides, some wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, prides of lions, lionesses and cubs. And this is one of my favorite lionesses. She's a lioness called Nomvelo. And you can actually recognize her easily because she's got a, a cauliflower in her right ear. Obviously a fight with another lion or a hyena when she was younger. Uh, and what's cool about her is she um, actually, and uh, she's the matriarch of her pride, but in her pride, whenever there's a kill, the cubs always eat first. And that's kind of unusual in lions, but that uh, gives you an idea about what a wonderful animal she is. Another one of my personal favorite animals is that cheetah. And up on the top left is a cheetah, we call her Queenie. And Queenie's a female now, she's getting into her, her uh, later years, but she single-handedly has raised nearly 20 young cheetah. Uh, and this is a picture I took a couple, about a year or two ago of her with four of her young teenager cubs, uh, teaching them how to climb up trees. But if you visit Wangi, you've got a chance of visiting um, her as well. And wild dogs, painted wolves, one of my favorite animals, uh, but Wangi's got as many as any other national park in um, uh, Zimbabwe. Um, there's about uh, 100, somewhere between 160 and 200 of them, adults. And uh, at any time, if you come and spend a week or 10 days in Wangi, you've got a very good chance of seeing um, wild dogs or painted wolves as they're more affectionately known. And gosh, the leopards, we all love leopards. Now, Wangi National Park has got more leopards than lions. And this big Tom, lovely picture of him in the evening light, and he's glaring at the camera and snarling as well at, at the camel thorn tree. But just what a lovely image it is. And buffalo. Man, we love buffalo. We've got lots of big herds of buffalo. And one of my favorite things in the dry season is sit next to a waterhole. And you often see a cloud of dust off in the distance as it's approaching. And when the cloud of dust gets closer and closer, you suddenly see what's at the bottom of the dust. It's a great big herd of buffalo, 500 or 1,000 strong, coming in to drink at Wanawangi's water holes. And I spoke a little bit about the species diversity. Lots of different animals, all kinds of cool things. And even though Wangi's a dry park, we've got hippo, we've got crocodiles, but we've got lots of other cool antelope. You've got roan antelope, um, you've got sable antelope, we've got eland, we've got kudu, we've got waterbuck, all and lots of them. Um, and there's a lot of parks elsewhere in Africa where you won't see many roan and you won't see many sable. But in Wangi, you see them, you come and spend a, a week with us and you're sure to see uh, a, a couple of birds of each. And the birds, you know, I spoke about the birds earlier. We've got over 400 species of birds in Wangi Park. And that battle eagle on the left is one of my favorites. But of course, lots of the uh, sexy multicolored bee eaters. And that's a lovely image down on the right there. That one of a crown crane, a uh, proud parent with their chick. Nice green season picture when they're nesting. And of course, drama. Wangi, like all other Africa's great parks, has got lots of drama. And that picture on the left there is a, a young roan that was grabbed by that uh, crocodile at a dam called the Tema. Uh, but fortunately, much to the delight of that roan's mother, uh, that young roan calf broke free from the crocodile and survived. Uh, unfortunately, that kudu down the lower, on the right-hand side there didn't survive. Uh, and that's a picture of Nobly there, uh, the famous wild dog dashing through the water before he pulled that kudu down to feed his uh, uh, tribe, his pack. And of course, Lots of lovely images, lots of lovely vistas, things you'll remember, pictures you'll take home, you'll, you'll use as screensavers, things you'll never forget. There's lots of these things to be seen in Wangi. Um, okay, and I think this is a very important part of what I'd like to talk about today as well, is when you come to Wangi, you don't just visit the wildlife, you don't just deal with the guides and the people in, in the camps, but come and visit Wangi's people too. And the people that are living and working in Wangi and living and working around Wangi, um, have got lots of wonderful stories to tell, uh, and they love hosting um, people from overseas. Zimbabweans are renowned for their hospitality and friendliness. And on the left, there's a couple of good friends of mine, that's Johnson and Dorothy Ngobe. He's the headman of uh, Ngamo village, and he loves to talk about his life and talk about the life of the people in his village. Sibo on the right there, she makes beautiful crafts that she loves to um, uh, sell and pass on to uh, the visitors and have a chat. And look at the smile on those kids' faces down the left there. Those kids have got their school lunch there, uh, and look at the grin there. Imagine how much fun you can have having, having lunch with those kids at their school. 
So I'd really encourage that as part of any trip to Wangi. You need to meet the people. And of course, it's not just the people that live around Wangi, but the people who work in Wangi. And I'd encourage you when you're taking one of those drives across Wangi from one of the camps to the, one of the other camps, is stop in and visit one of the um, uh, uh, national parks or anti-poaching stations uh, and have a chat with the guys. And this is a team, of, a team from the uh, Scorpions anti-poaching unit. Uh, and they love talking to you and telling you about the stories and about these are the real heroes, the guys that live on the front line of conservation. And these are the guys that look after Wangi and its 50,000 elephant and all the other animals. Um, and I'd in, encourage you to support them as well. well. Okay, when you talk about Wangi and you talk about any park in Africa, I think it's important that you understand the seasons. And again, the, um, the team at Safari Destinations will help you when you're planning your trip. But our season, I'm gonna start off here with a rainy season. Um, and our rainy, our green season kind of starts with the first rains usually in about November, and they usually finish in about March, April. Um, and that's when um, things are kind of green and wet. We call it our green season. But what's cool about Wangi is you can uh, come and visit Wangi. Wangi is, uh, can be a green season destination. A lot of parks elsewhere, elsewhere in Africa, uh, you can't get into them during uh, the rainy season, but Wangi you can. And the reason is because of the sand. And that geology map I showed you on, your, on, on the big map I showed you earlier will show you two thirds of Wangi has got sand under it. So you've still got 10,000 square kilometers of sand that you can drive around in during the green season. And there's a good illustration of it, the Land Rover uh, with hard sand underneath going through the water. And look at that image there. What a, great, what a great scene, what's something to be able to see. I'd encourage people, don't just come in the dry season, come and look at us during the, the green season. You can see things as pretty as that. Green grass up to your knees, knee high, water everywhere, elephants, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Blue skies with white clouds. Uh, what a lovely picture for you to take home. And look at that, you know, um, big open green grasslands, water and water lilies, big fat pregnant, well-fed lioness there, and a herd of wildebeest and calves, you know, beautiful image again from the green season. And this next picture, and I've got lots of them, people always say, oh, that looks like the Okavango Delta. No, that's not the Okavango Delta, that's in Wangi National Park in the green season. Uh, pans filled with water lilies. Again, you can take a picture looking in any direction and it'll be a, a keeper, a screensaver. And zebra and wildebeest splashing through water, lovely green season image. And of course, one of the other uh, reasons to come during the green season, that's when all of the youngsters out. And there's nothing cuter than lion cubs and elephant calves. And in this case, uh, jackal pups playing with bones. Um, and that really was, that's one of the things that makes the green season trip special, I believe anyway. And the birds, you know, the birds. Uh, every time you take a photograph of one, if you look closely, you'll see there's two other species there. You're taking a picture of three different species of birds. That's a beautiful saddleable stalk there looking for some frogs in the wetlands. But as things start to dry up, and this is a picture probably taken from June and July, uh, as things start to uh, dry up, uh, that green grass turns, turns golden and yellow, you know, and the water starts to get less and Wangi's herds start to congregate around the water holes. Um, this next picture gives an idea, and that's picture probably from about July, August. The grass has gone brown, it's golden, and the elephants are starting to congregate around the water holes. And of course, this is a great time in Wangi. You can just sit around a water hole and wait and take, take pictures and the wildlife will come to you. You don't have to do much driving at all. And of course, here's a late dry season picture taken at one of Wangi's camps. You can see there the water hole's really dry, but in this case, you don't even have to leave camp to see lots and lots of wildlife right in camp coming in to drink the water holes. And this picture here may be the most dramatic. This is a picture taken from about this time of year. You're getting into late October even in here, uh, just before the rain starts, uh, really dry, really harsh. And this is where Wangi is at its harshest. You know, this is when times are tough. Uh, the elephant herds come to water here and then they have to turn around. They drink quickly, turn and they march again and march 20, 30 kilometers away to go and get food before they feed as much as they can and march back for water. It's a harsh but very, very um, uh, inspiring time of year as well. But then of course, the rains arrive and they arrive usually with thunderstorms in Africa and lightning and pictures like this. And that's when there is relief, you know, and there's water again and uh, the pressure is off and the next green season starts in this endless cycle through the year. Okay, so what do we do when we 
come to Wangi, okay? There's lots of stuff to do, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that now. Obviously, you can go for game drives like you can in any of uh, Africa's uh, parks. Um, and you can see here, here's some visitors in a Land Rover, and they're uh, taking pictures of these cheetah here. And a lot of, a lot of Wangi's wildlife is uh, used to cameras, and they'll pose nicely for you. And of course, very, very special getting up close on your game drive with Wangi's elephants. Um, and you get up close and you can take great photos and see what they're doing and study them and learn about them from your guide. Um, but to me, one of the best things you can do in Wangi is to get out on foot. And this is one of the special things about Wangi that a lot of Africa's, as Africa's other parks, you can't necessarily do, any, do um, many foot safaris. But Zimbabwe's guides are renowned in Africa for being some of the best in Africa. And uh, Wangi's got, uh, got, got uh, the lion's share of those guides. Um, and this is um, one of Wangi's pro guides giving a, a team of guests here a safety briefing before they go on a walk. Uh, and make sure it's, uh, it's safe and it's um, uh, conducted in a, a careful manner. But here, look at the results. And how cool is that? You can be up close with elephants in a Land Rover or a Land Cruiser, but when you're up close with them on foot, very, very, very special. And this is something that you can do in Wangi, and this is what Wangi is very, very famous for. Foot safaris and uh, enjoying Wangi's elephants on foot. But of course, as well, not just the elephants. Imagine that, walking up on a herd of buffalo. Uh, and look at, uh, you can imagine what an experience that is. People have been on a game drive, but you get up close on those with, with a big herd of buffalo on foot, and it changes everything completely. Certainly a completely different dynamic. And of course, and this is the holy grail for me, is uh, on foot with the uh, with the wild dogs, you know. Um, just a, this is the kind of experience that you never ever forget. And of course, one of the other cool things about being on foot is you start to see some of the smaller stuff that you might miss when you're on a game drive. And this is a little family of dwarf mongoose uh, in the morning sun here, warming up. That we uh, photo I took while we were on a, a game walk a few months back. Okay, Wangi. Also, you can get out at night, and in the private concessions. We go on night drives. And that picture on the left using a red filter, spotlight with a red filter, so you don't damage, you don't upset the um, nocturnal animal's eyes uh, as a leopard, very nocturnal animal. And of course, the picture on the, on the right I love, that's a giant eagle owl. You can see all the blood on that bird's uh, bill and on his feet, getting up to the bloody business that uh, eagle owls get up to at night. And of course, when you come to Wangi, one of the other great fun things is to go and eat outside. One of the best things you can do, I believe, is to go and have a picnic lunch next to a waterhole. And uh, look at the smiles on everybody's faces there. And I think they're having cheeseburgers for lunch there next to the elephants. A uh, nice break from a game drive. And you're not going to be locked in with uh, having to be back at camp at a, set, at a set time for a set lunch. But just uh, enjoy the national park and spend the day out there. And during lunchtime, sometimes there's a little bit of drama too. A couple of elephants running past here. They're not interested in anything else except getting down to the waterhole uh, and having, um, having their lunch. I spoke earlier about how much fun it is to sit around one of Wangi's waterholes and you just take pictures and let the animals come to you. Um, and uh, you can think about the experience that guy's having there. You can imagine the pictures he's getting. But one of the real fun things that Wangi's operators do, have, do do is you'll see is that many of them have built uh, photography blinds. And this is a blind we call a, a lookup blind. And next to a, a waterhole, you look between the elephant's legs, you can see the... Um, uh, guests inside the blind there, you can imagine the pictures they're getting right up close down at toe, at, uh, toe level with that elephant. Here's some other guests climbing into a log pile blind. It's another uh, narrow water hole. And once you're inside one of those blinds, it's hard to imagine, it's hard to explain the experience that you have, but you know, you really are up close. You know, these elephants are within touching distance of you. And um, you can really, they don't know you're there, they don't see you, and they, they go about their lives in their normal fashion. So you can see all the interactions between the different bulls and within the breeding herds. Look at the delight on that young lady's face on the left there while she's taking a selfie. Uh, and, and what a great selfie that is to have to take home. And you can get these pictures in Wangi. And there's a picture. Elephant's got his trunk inside there. He's trying to smell, you see who's inside the photography blind. And that, with his trunk smeared up against my, the front of my camera lens while I get a photograph. Uh, and that's what happens in Wangi. And there's the kind of pictures that you can take. You're down at toe level, uh, up close with the, the animals, and there's a wonderful picture of that little elephant calf leaning forward with his foot up while he sucks up some water into his trunk. 
I spoke to you earlier about that railway line. There's a um, lot of things that make Wangi unique, but one of the things that does make it unique is this railway line that runs across the northern part of the park. And I told you the railway line was put through in 1904. So all of Wangi's wildlife is completely used to, all of the wildlife that's alive today, is completely used to the um, railway tracks. And there's a lion there lounging on there. And this um, leads on to the Elephant Express. What a great way to travel across Wangi on the Elephant Express. Uh, and you have to beware of the elephants, you can see from the signpost, but you also got to beware of the uh, lions. Lovely two or three hour run across Wangi. I'd encourage anybody visiting Wangi to make sure you're on the Elephant Express. There's a couple of Wangi's operators that also do horseback riding, and you can horseback ride in Wangi. Um, and these, both these pictures here are taken from uh, green season horse rides. That's my favorite time to ride around with the water and the birds and the animals, but you can imagine how much fun that, that is. Uh, with experienced pro guides who know what they're doing and will make sure you're not going to ride into any kind of trouble. And you can even mountain bike in Wangi. This is one of the camps in the west of Wangi. Um, guys do mountain biking there down the old um, elephant trails, the ancient elephant trails that run down between the uh, old fossil sand dunes there. And what, what great fun that is to stop your bicycle, lean it up against a tree and get a few pictures of the wildlife there. But then, of course, I spoke as well about uh, how important I believe it is for you when you're visiting Wangi to also go and visit one of the communities uh, that, that live around Wangi. Um, very interesting people, lots of interesting cultures. Um, there's the Indabele people on the south side, the Nambe people on the north side, decorating their houses. And that's a picture of one of my friends, Dorothy Mube, who loves to tell stories about her life. And she'll show you around her uh, family home and tell you all about uh, what it's like to live next door to Wangi National Park. And one of the other things I'd encourage you to do when you're down there amongst communities is go and visit the schools. Um, and you'll find the, the heads and the teachers of most of the schools actually love hosting guests because they believe it's very good for the education of these young kids to understand what tourism is about. And they get to meet people from all over the world. One of my favorite ways to go to school is actually to walk to school with the kids in the morning. Have a nice little two or three kilometer walk uh, with those kids. And by the time you arrive at school, you've broken down some of the barriers and everybody's friends and it's not them and us but you, you become buddies and there's, and there's no barriers. And then of course, what you wanna do is go and spend a half an hour in the classroom with those kids and tell them about where you're from, what part of the world, let them understand about that the world's a bigger place. Um, parts of the world they might, never, might not ever see, but let them learn about it and listen to your accent and uh, learn some words from the languages you speak because what they love to do is teach you some of the words from the languages they speak and what you struggle as they struggle with English and what you struggle in the belly. And there's a teacher there teaching uh, somebody how to say, I'm a koko and I'm a kanda, which means literally eggs and frogs, but everybody struggles with all the clicks. And while you're there at the village, spend some money. You, 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 you have choices as a, a visitor and you can spend money at the Dubai duty-free or at the duty-free in Joburg, but I'd really encourage you to spend some money amongst the, these villages, these people that live on the front lines of, of Africa's national parks. And in Wangi, they'll, uh, They'll uh, take, take good care of you and you'll get a, a, a memento that is a real memento of your, of your visit. And then in Wangi, this happens at a lot of the camps. We have swimming pools for our guests, but Wangi's elephants, they don't give a damn between a, a water hole and a swimming pool. They don't mind swimming pool water at all. And uh, where else can you get a photograph like that of an uh, elephant drinking from a swimming pool? And even in the late dry season there, they've drunk the swimming pool dry and they've actually got into the swimming pool. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that can happen for you in Wangi. And then at the end of your safari day, of course, what's going to happen is sunset. And sunset means sundowner time. And sundowner time, you want to kick back and relax, chill, and just start thinking about the wonderful day that you've had. Speak to your guide and order a, a cool drink. And I'd encourage an adult beverage. A gin and tonic is my favorite for a sundowner. And then look west. Get your camera out and take a picture. And you can get pictures like that every evening in Wangi National Park. Uh, elephants, sunsets, water, or might be buffalo in the sunset, but you'll get wonderful, wonderful pictures every sunset. And then in the evening, you head back to camp. huh? You sit around the campfire after your shower and you tell stories about the day. And here you get the elephant. Here come the elephants again. What a, what a great uh, image that is around sitting around a campfire in Wangi National Park, enjoying the elephants and uh, telling stories. And afterwards, you're going to be having dinner. And whether you're in a camp that's serving you dinner under the stars, 
where you're not going to have a five-star dinner, you're going to have a 5,000-star dinner, or you're having a dinner next to the elephants. You're going to get a pictures and pictures that you're going to take home and images you'll never forget, you know, and experiences. Where else can you get a photograph like that? But of course, all these stories about wildlife and beautiful images and pictures, um, they, they didn't all happen by accident. And it all happens because of a lot of hard work. Um, and I'm very proud to be part of that group of operators in Wangi National Park that do a lot for conservation and looking after not only our wildlife, but our people. And a lot of that story starts in, because Wangi is a very, very dry place. And for six months of the year, it's a very, very harsh environment. Um, and the first warden of Wangi National Park, Ted Davison, he um, actually put windmills back. He put the first windmills in Wangi Park in 1935. And that was so that he could keep the wildlife within his dry, dry national park year round, so he could protect them. Um, and since then, that network of windmills that he started with has grown into a big network of, um, of uh, waterholes that service Wangi's uh, wildlife um, using both solar energy and solar hybrid energy. And by the time you get into the dry season like we are in right now, we have uh, a network of over 60 um, pumped water holes that are supported by Wangi's operators and the NGOs that give us a help hand. And that's the kind of image you see. We've got 50,000 elephants that are drinking water today and tonight from pumped water. And that's all thanks to a lot of hard, hard work uh, and a heck of a lot of money. Um, that all comes from uh, the tourism operators who operate in Wangi. It's not just about elephant either. Hey? Obviously, every single animal in Wangi that is water dependent, whether they be kudu or sable or lion, uh, they drink pumped water. And this image here, this next image is harsh. And that's a poached elephant. But it, you can see its front of its face has been cut off while the poachers have hacked ivory out of its face. But uh, I'm proud to say in Wangi National Park, there's more elephants, much more elephants will die of natural causes this year than die of poaching. Um, and that's because we take good care of our wildlife in Wangi. Uh, very, very low levels of poaching. And that all also comes from a lot of hard work. And there's a National Parks Ranger, it's a photo I took years ago of a, a lonely park ranger, you can imagine on patrol on his own. Um, but what we do as Wangi's operators, wow. Sorry, that's thunder and lightning outside. Our rainy season's close, thank God. But what we as Wangi's operators have done is, um, We've uh, supported our national parks um, uh, and we built uh, picket bases. We built ranger stations for them dotted around in remote parts of the park where they can base up. Uh, and we beef up the national parks patrols with um, teams. I showed you that photograph earlier of a team called the Scorpions. This is another team called the Cobras who just uh, beef up um, the thin stretch national parks rangers. And here they've been collecting a big pile of wire snares, that terrible, terrible thing we see in Africa. And Wangi's guides, very, very proud to say every year, Wangi's guides get involved with the parks patrols. And this is a photo I took a few months back uh, with, with the COVID and Corona lockdown, very few tourists for our guides to take uh, out and about. So what they're doing instead is they are getting out and foot and they're patrolling Wangi. And suddenly a two-man patrol becomes a four-man patrol and it's a much more effective team. Sorry, I don't know how much you can hear that thunder. I'm smiling though, we've got rain coming. Okay, but part of the story also goes on the, around the boundaries of Wangi Park. Um, and that image there shows Wangi Park stretching off into the distance, but in the foreground are the people who live around Wangi. And there's thousands of families of poor subsistence farmers that live around the boundaries of Wangi. And if you're a subsistence farmer, you grow millet and you grow corn. And if you're trying to grow that next to 50,000 elephant, human wildlife conflict arises. Uh, and these elephants come out of the park every year and they go into the fields. Uh, that belong to these people, these poor people. Uh, and what happens to a lot of them is they lose all of their food. This is this terrible thing that we have to deal with, we call human wildlife conflict. And the human wildlife conflict is not only about herbivores, it's about the carnivores too, too. And they come out of the parks and they kill both livestock that belongs to the people as well as people. Every year there are people killed by uh, Wangi's lions. And this all leads to this thing, this, this horrible cycle. And I talk about poverty and hunger, malnutrition, and this leads to poaching. You get two kinds, you get many kinds of poaching. You obviously get the rhino poaching and the ivory poaching that's spoken about a lot. But most of the poaching that goes on in Africa is for meat and it's for people to feed their families. Uh, so we get more conflict. 
So what do Wangi's operators do? We get in and we try and mitigate the conflict by supporting our communities. And I'm very, very proudly part of a group of um, businesses that do a huge amount of work in that. Um, and just a quick count, I counted up over 75 different primary and secondary schools that get support from Wangi's operators. We give the kids game drives, we take them on conservation camps, and we look after them in a, a bunch of different ways. Look at the smiles on those high school girls there walking to school and how proud they are going to school that's supported by a Wangi operator. And we support them through building infrastructure. We build classroom blocks. We build teachers' cottages. We stick balls, we put water at those schools so the kids can get water when they come to school. And we provide them with the teachers with the teaching materials. One project I'm very proud to be part of as part that works in Wangi is the Wangi School Books Project. And last year, in just one year, they provided 30,000 free curriculum school textbooks to the kids around Wangi. It was at over 68 different schools. These were schools that otherwise would have had no textbooks at all. They'd been completely left off the map, but they're getting them from the Wangi School Books Project. And look at that image on the right there of a, an older brother who's learned to read and he's teaching his younger brother to read. And that's the kind of thing that's uh, very important to what's going to be the future of Wangi. Another great program that I love, I know um, in the southern side of Wangi there, I know last year over 500,000 school meals were delivered to school kids at um, thousands of school, of school kids every day came to school and they got a school meal there. And that helps attendance at school, maintains energy levels and improves concentration. And even this year, you know, during those terrible lockdowns, we've got a, we had a terrible drought here with a lot of hunger. People are hungry. They've been dealing with elephants. They've been dealing with no tourism, no money. And uh, these are photographs I've taken over the past few months, dropping off uh, tons and tons of food at villages, not only for the school kids who are doing homeschooling, but also for the parents and families just to help them get through the year. And domestic water supplies. We provide water inside the park for our wildlife and we've got to take care of the people too. We drill wells, uh, put in pumps, and these days now even solar water, that pumps the water for those people. Uh, again, um, there's probably hundreds of wells around Wangi that have been sponsored by tourism and by tourists and by operators from inside the park. And all the Wangi's operators, we encourage guests with philanthropy to uh, the kids and people that live around Wangi. In this case, uh, um, new school shoes for the kids make that walk to school easier. Soccer balls and neck balls, all the kinds of things that put smiles on kids' faces uh, and gets them involved with tourism and with the benefits of living next door to Wangi National Park instead of just dealing with problems. One of my favorite programs, the Smile and Sea Safari. Um, it's set to uh, run its, in its 10th year this year in December. And it's a group of European, Spanish and Italian, mainly doctors and dentists uh, who come over every year. And in the past, since 2011, they have seen 27,000 patients from over 200 villages. They've given over 50,000 free procedures to people who otherwise wouldn't have seen any first world uh, medical care. I'm very, very proud of what uh, that program does for the people that live around Wangi. And like I said to you, this all comes down to it. And this is what Wangi is about. And I'm being very, very, I think Wangi's got it right. We uh, encourage responsible tourism and we encourage uh, guests who uh, get out and do things right. And they in turn uh, look after both the people and the wildlife. And we get this lovely trinity uh, that's a sustainable model for uh, tourism and for conservation going forward, where we're looking after both the wildlife and the people and tourism is doing it the right way. All right, I'm sorry I dragged on a little bit. I was kind of trying to talk slowly in case of the uh, uh, language issues and the um, uh, and my Wi-Fi issues, but I hope it was worked well. And thanks very much. All right, I'm going to stop the share here. Is that correct, Karina? Give me a thumbs up. Okay. Cool. That was thanks very much. I'm going to mute myself too. We'll, there'll be some questions later if anybody would like. Yeah, we have a couple of questions, which uh, Ursh and I will answer now, but which that was completely inspirational. Thank you so much. It was amazing. Thank you so much. Really awesome. So now I'm very sad because I'm stuck here and I can't go to Wengi anytime soon. Um, but I'm planning to come Christmas, by the way. <laughs> I should book. Yes, I know. <laughs> so I'm lucky. Um, I'll share my screen now quickly. Um, and then we can continue. Um, with the presentation. I've taken some notes of some questions. 
some very, very interesting questions um, during, during Butch's presentation. So thanks again, Butch. Um, Ursula, would you like to start with the map and then we'll answer the questions as we go along. One question was about green season. Butch, when you spoke about green season, a question came up. Are there camps slash areas closed during green season or are all areas accessible? I guess the question referred to the fact that you said around about, uh, I don't know what you said, I think the percentage you said 10,000 square whatever is sand and the rest is not sand. So it's not easily accessible with vehicles. That was one question. And then another question, I think Ursula, you can answer in a moment is about connecting the different areas in Wengi by self-drive. So I would like to hand over to Ursh now to answer the questions. If you need assistance from Butch, he's around. So let's, let's start. I've put up a map. This is one of our tools that Safari Destinations has created. This is the Wengi map where you can see all the different camps in Wengi, the different areas, etc. And in addition to this map, we also have a, a very, very clever map which shows the eight different airstrips that Butch mentioned earlier and that helps in the planning and in the combination of different areas. So over to you, Ursh. Okay, thank you everybody and um, Karina and Butch. That was an amazing presentation. It made me want to go and get in my car and drive the two and a half hours to main camp. <laughs> Um, I also personally love the green season, and one of the reasons I love it um, is that your predator activity is increased at that time of the year, because you've got all your young are being born at that time of the year. Um, and yes, it may be a little bit more difficult to see them, but again, it depends which camp you're going into. I'd like to answer Manu's question first on the question and answer chat. And Manu asked, in green season, certain parts of Wangi will be closed. And that is correct. It's not, actually, it's not correct. There's certain camps in Wangi that close in the green season, simply because there isn't the high demand that there is during the high season. And they use that time to refurbish their camps, give their staff off. And it will normally be January, February, which is during the peak of our rainfall, which as you heard from Butch is starting to start. Um, here in Big Falls, we had rain last night and two days prior to that. Big storms, short, massive thunder uh, showers with lightning, maybe last 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, and it's over and you can get out on your game drive in between all of that. So in terms of the park areas, all areas are open. Access becomes an issue. And those camps that are closed for that refurb or renovation or time that they need to get their staff off, even if they are closed, there are alternatives. So please don't forget that. Manu, I hope I've answered your question adequately. Uh, the next question was the one about self-drive. Um, I'm just checking who that was from. Yeah, the question was, um, if, um, we recommend for self-drives to connect different areas. I do. I think, Urs, what's important to explain is the private concessions, right? There are certain areas in the park that are easily accessible and others are restricted to the camps in the concessions, but maybe you can explain that better in terms of what's allowed in the private concessions and what's not and, and which areas are easily combinable. Okay, in terms of private concessions, they don't like to generally have guests drive in. However, uh, many of them will allow you to drive to main camp, park your vehicle, and then they will collect you by game drive. But during the, the dry season, it is possible for self-drive clients in four by fours to access most park areas. And I, we would generally advise you to focus on the, the north around the main campsite where you've got that soil that Butch spoke about that drains off easily and you don't get stuck as much, um, which is part of the fun. 
of doing self-drive. And in the north of the park, there's a different kind of terrain. It's, it's thick black cotton soil and that you definitely will get stuck in. During the dry season though, connecting north, south, doing a self-drive itinerary shouldn't be a problem, but you want to try and avoid those private concessions in that case, which are fully inclusive anyway of your activities. So if you were self-driving, again, we would be we would be recommending to you certain camps that have the correct meal plan basis that allows you to experience the park on your own um, and and then still being able to access those camps in your own hire vehicle. You definitely do need a four by four. So Brian, uh, that was your question. I hope that I've answered that adequately. Okay. Thanks, Arush. I also yeah, would you like to add something? Otherwise, we continue with the access because so now one access we have covered, which is the self-drive access. Zimbabwe is an ideal self-drive destination. And um, the stunning thing about Wengi I would like to mention and also in general about uh, Zimbabwe is that it's more affordable than some of its neighbors. And I'm sure most of you in the audience here know that our uh, bigger office is actually based in Mount Botswana. Botswana is in a very unlucky position that the borders remain closed. Zimbabwe is open and Zimbabwe has always offered a very, very large variety of levels of camps. So from the super top luxurious camp all the way to a more affordable, authentic camp, you can have any experience you, you're looking for. And in terms of the access, so one is the self-drive, which of course can link Wengi also with other areas in Zimbabwe. And I'm handing over um, to Ursh. Butch has already explained the stunning Elephant Express, which you, see, you can see I've actually stolen one of your pictures. Um, and the other options to access Wengi are by road um, or by plane. Over to you, Ursh. Thank you. I was just replying. There was another question from oh. Marco about the Elephant Express. Super. Uh, Marco's question was if the Elephant Express could be used by other camps. Generally, the Elephant Express is used as a unique transfer service between Death Railway Station and Ngamo. So it gets people to and from Bamani or Camelthorne. But if you have a dual camp combination in Wangi, say you're at Bamani and you come down on the Elephant Express and then are going to a camp in the north, such as Camp Wangi, Camp Wangi will collect you from that train station and drive you through the park to their camp. So ideally, yes, it is only exclusive for Bamani and Camelthorne, um, but can be collected or dropped off from any other camp in the park that's within the north-south area. Okay, right. So now we're going to talk about airstrip access. Um, Karina, on your slides, would you mind going back to the Wangi map? Not the very first one. Just so that you can all see. And what I'd like to show you here is the airstrip access. So. There are a number of airstrips, and there are some camps where we recommend that guests only fly to and from them, simply because the road transfers can be quite lengthy. So an example of that would be something like Joseph Benini. If you're coming from Victoria Falls to try and access Joseph Benini, that is approximately two and a half hours to main camp plus another four. So you're looking at about a six and a half hour road transfer, which isn't really that ideal. If the flights are arriving in Vic Falls midday, it means that you have to overnight your guests. Whereas if you fly, you can fly straight from Vic Falls Airport to the airstrip at Joseph Benini, which is Lubuti. The airstrip access in the north, we have Robin's uh, airstrip, which is um, a very, very good airstrip. And in fact, I believe can be used in all weather. It didn't shut down during the rainy season last year, as well as Giraffe Springs, which access um, is to Nehemba and Camp Wangi 
primarily. Robin's airstrip is used by Robin's, Wangi Bush Camp, Detima, those sort of camps that are up in the north. So in terms of your flying time, if you fly from Vic Falls into any one of these Wangi airstrips or camps, you're looking at no, no more than an hour flight. Whereas in general, if you are utilizing a road transfer, it is two and a half hours from Vic Falls to the gates at the park, and then on average, two hours to your camp. So again, that would be a four and a half hour minimum road transfer. In terms of road transfer, there are three main access points. Up in the north, you can come through Nantwich Camp and Cinematella Gate, and then down in the main camp area, you come through the main camp gate. And Bamani also has, Bamani and Camelthorne have an access point from the main highway through to the camps from halfway house. This is really only used for self-drive guests and you still need an Avello vehicle to meet you, to guide you into this, those camps. Thanks, Urs. I think we have to speed it up a little bit. So I'm going to continue. Um, I would just like to mention that we have a lot of information on our agents corner for everybody in this call now. Um, cheat sheets, information about access, etc. And then of course, you always have the team on the ground uh, that's happy to answer all questions um, in terms of access and connections and all of that. Uh, Butch spoke very nicely earlier about the, the huge variety of different activities. Um, I don't think we have to go into the detail about it again, but in the chat room there was uh, a couple of, well, comments, but I don't think anyone asked where the mountain biking is possible. So what I made notes of was, so which camps offer the riding and which camp offers the mountain biking? I know the answer, but I would like to, uh, to let Urs answer the question because it's a unique thing to be on a mountain bike in, in the bush. It's a very, very special thing to be a little bit more active. If you can answer those two questions, Urs, please. Yes, absolutely. I'd be more than happy to. So the only camp in Wangi National Park that was given the special permission to use the mountain biking is Joseph Benini. And that is an Umbello camp property and it was uh, given as a test license to see whether it would work. And it works very, very well. There have been no incidents within the park. The Umbello guides are very highly trained and highly skilled. And guests that have participated in this mountain biking um, say that it is one of the most exciting and different kind of ways that they have ever seen wildlife from. Yeah. So I hope that answers that question. And That's then we are going to move to the horse riding. Yes. So the horse riding again, um, these horses were originally based outside of the national park, quite close to main camp near Miombo. Mm -hmm. And since, the, and from there, they were offering short horse trails up the dead play line, which is outside the park. And from that, seeing the success of that, some of those horses have now been relocated to C Camel Thorn is where their stables are and are offered um, as daily rides, either uh, an intermediate ride or an experienced ride that might be longer. They also offer those trips to go into the community areas um, and do a community ride uh, with all the villages, um, and that's at Bamani at Camelthorn. And then there is a specialized package that African bush camps, along with Rides Zimbabwe, did last year, which is a seven night scheduled safari that is for your equestrian fanatics that want to do wildlife and, and, and horses. So Samalisa was the base camp at which the safari took off and ended from, but you camped wild for some of the nights on that safari. 
so we can do both. You can either do a, the full seven nights if you're a full equestrian fanatic, or you can stay at one of the camps outside the park and just do a two hour ride or a sunset ride, or you can um, book in at the Marnie and Camelthorn and, and incorporate those rides into your itinerary during your stay. Awesome, thanks so much, Urs. Um, I don't think we have to go further into the activities. I think what I would like to say from my personal experience is that the guiding in Zimbabwe in general and uh, especially in Wengi is outstanding. And um, I can, I, I mean, I personally can compare it to a couple of neighboring countries. And um, I would like to say for any safari uh, enthusiast um, that, that loves walking in the bush, Wengi is the place to be. Um, it's, it's amazing, um, unforgettable experience that your clients can get. What I also think is very, very relevant, uh, these pictures earlier, which that you showed with the pools, all these empty pools, my God, stunning. Um, I think what's special about Wengi too, in comparison to other safari destinations is that in most camps, from the camp, you just sit in the camp and you sit there and the animals come. And that's a unique thing. And it invites clients to slower travel. I think in the times that we're experiencing at the moment, um, I have realized that what's very important is that we change a little bit the rhythm, <laughs> our rhythm of life, and possibly also our rhythm of traveling once it's possible again, and it is possible in Zimbabwe. So what we highly recommend is slower travel, longer stays per camp. I think it's ideal uh, to spend six nights in Wengi easily, which I completely agree with you. I mean, I could spend two weeks, there's no problem. Just sit in camp and look at the animals and don't go on any game drive. Um, so I think that just needs to be mentioned. So the heights, the view from the camps, the walks make Wangi super unique and it's, it's very, very difficult to compete with that. My personal opinion, if anyone is interested. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on this slide. We have a lot of family friendly camps in um, Wangi as well. So it's an ideal, it's an ideal park. Um, for individuals and for families with children. There's a lot of special offers out there at the moment. Every camp and every company is of course hoping to generate some business now in the green season. We do completely understand that the people are very hesitant to travel. The clients are very hesitant to commit to travel. But if you have clients thinking of traveling in the next few months, there's some outstanding green season specials out there. Also for families. Um, most of these camps have family units. If uh, you're not sure, ask Ursula, the expert on the ground. She can, she can make uh, recommendations. And uh, we've put together, us at Safari Destinations have uh, worked the last few days on putting together a couple of, well, four actually, green season special packages where we apply certain specials. Uh, several of the camps offer a third night for free. So it's not obvious now because first, if, if you just look at the left um, package, the package on the left, the intricate uh, Wengi, um, the third night for free is for free, so the, the price doesn't change. We've tried to incorporate different areas, so the north and the south. Um, these packages, I'm not going to go into detail, are all available on our package overview on the agent's corner. You can see at the bottom the flags. The flags mean that we have way two links for all of those packages in English, German and French. Paco, for you and for many other friends from Spain that, that have joined us this afternoon, unfortunately not Spanish yet, but if you need any help in Spanish, you know that Christine is always around, not far a Skype call away. So these packages are available on the agent's corner. And yeah, on the agent's corner as well, in this presentation, we of course also make available for you. We have broken down uh, Wangi National Park into four areas and uh, Urs <clears throat> put down in words accessibility and what's the difference and what is the experience that you can have um, for which clients are which areas and which camps ideal. So I'm not going to go into detail now, but we give you access to all of this and you can then look it up. We will load this little presentation as well on our agents corner and then you can study the, the different slides individually. I don't know, Ursh, if you want to say something about the different areas, um, just maybe explain quickly what's the, what's the difference between main area, main camp outside the park, inside the park. Thank you. So 
for me, one what one of the main difference about the camps that are outside the park is they have um, better access to community projects because you don't have to drive so far to get to Det Village or um, the the village that borders the money and Camelthorn. And along with that, there's also the Painted Dog Conservation Center, which we would like guests to support. It is donation based. There's a lot of great work being done there. Um, and so the, cap, the lodges that are outside the park have easier access to all of those things. Whereas the camps inside the park at, on the main campsite need to travel a little bit further and camps such as Davison's, Linquash or Wilderness will do a completely different kind of village visit to what's outside the park. In terms of the, the, the camps outside the park, they will take guests into the park throughout the main camp area, as well as on their own private concessions. So for me, that's really what differentiates the camps in and out. And obviously the camps outside the park, a little bit more reasonably priced and perfect for self-drive. Do I need to elaborate more, Karina? No, I think it's it's fine, Ursh. I think um, we have um, run out of time anyway, because I've promised that we stay within an hour. We didn't quite manage that. Um, I'll just close this quickly because I'm in full screen mode, so I don't really see if there's more questions. Um, did we answer all questions? I think we did. So what I would like to just um, say at the end of this of this presentation that it's it's amazing how I missed being on safari, which <laughs> um, it, um, it's, it has certainly put a couple of tears into my eyes because um, the last six, seven months were very, very difficult for all of us. The audience is all um, people that work in the tourism industry, which has been hit the hardest, but but uh, we are also very resilient and I think we're fighters. What really made me a bit emotional was when you spoke about the communities around the park, which if there is anything that any of us can do to, to support as well. So if there is anything you would like us to share with the audience when we send out um, the recording, please do because I know that uh, without any income, for the suppliers in the park, um, well, generally in Zimbabwe, but we're speaking about Wengi now, it's very, very hard because it's a very expensive exercise to, to, to help the local communities and to protect, of course, the animals, the wildlife and all of that. So from my side, thank you very much. I'm happy to hand over to Butch for a last couple of sentences. The microphone, Butch. <laughs> Please. My apologies there. Sorry, I'm a Zimbo. Yeah, thanks so much, Karina. Thank you, Ursh, for giving us the opportunity to talk about uh, my most favorite place in the world. And um, thanks to all of you for attending and listening. Um, and uh, I would certainly um, echo what Karina's just said. Uh, we will all get through this together. We'll all figure it out. And we're looking forward to seeing you one day back here in Wangi. Uh, and Wangi's elephants are waiting. They're not going anywhere. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And thanks, Urs. You want to say a couple of sentences before we before we say goodbye? I would just like to thank everybody for participating today. And as Karina has already said, Zimbabwe is open. So you want your clients to travel, anybody who's willing, we're here. Yes, um, we actually have our first guests arriving in the next 10 days. Um, actually, two lots of them, so we're super excited. It's, uh, it's a funny feeling to know that guests are traveling again. We can't wait to welcome them to Zimbabwe. And we hope that we inspired you guys a little bit to just carry this emotion and, and passion that would shared with us for Wengi, for Zimbabwe to your clients. And um, yeah, every client, every booking counts. So we're grateful for everything. And if you have questions, we'll send the recording um, in the next few days. Otherwise, we're an email away. So just let us know if you have any questions. Thanks so much. So it was lovely chatting to you. Bye-bye. Um,